came here, Pastor Ron and all the team. And thank you to Pastor David for the uh, privilege of being with you this morning. I'm so grateful to share in the Word of God with you this weekend. I'm going to be speaking from the about the cross. I think it's my favorite topic. <laughs> I'm a lover of the cross. I'm a friend of the cross. And I uh, just want to mention that I've written a book on the cross. I think this just might be my favorite book that I've written. And uh, make sure that you get your copy before you leave today. Because it'll warm your heart. It'll uh, put a fresh flame in your heart for the cross of Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's everything. You know, when you see the cross, it just kind of fills your screen. And, and nothing else really is of significance. All other conversation stops in the presence of the cross of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you for your cross. Thank you that you have given us the perfect wisdom of God in the cross that informs our lives and everything that we're about. Thank you for your cross. And Lord, I'm asking that there would be a release of grace as, the, as we've been just touching the river and enjoying the river. May the river that flows from the wounds in your cross refresh every heart in this room today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nobody saw the cross. It was that middle cross that everybody was staring at. They were all gaping at it, and nobody actually saw it. There wasn't a single person that day that stood in front of the cross and said to Jesus, you're the real Passover lamb. You're taking away the sins of the whole world right now. You are dividing human history in two. And you are redeeming man to God from every nation and every tribe and every language. Nobody saw this. Nobody prophesied over the cross. Nobody said to him that day, you're doing Isaiah 53 right now. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. By your stripes we are healed. Nobody pointed at him and said, you're fulfilling Genesis 3.15 right now. You're taking it in the heel, but you are crushing Satan in the head. Nobody said to him, you're running the greatest race of human history. Run! Nobody said to him, you're fighting the greatest battle of human history. Fight! Nobody actually saw the cross. And not much has changed. <laughs> We're still not seeing the cross today. We fill our churches on Easter Sunday. We see crucifixes on our steeples and in our sanctuaries. And we're still not seeing the cross. Lord Jesus, would you get the witchcraft out of my eyes? Would you get the junk out of my eyes? Would you clear my eyes up today, Lord Jesus, that I might see, that I might have eyes to see? Give me a spirit of revelation today, that as the preacher speaks, that I might see the cross in a new way. May the Lord answer that prayer for you today. 
My text is in Luke 24. Luke 24. By the way, if, if there's somebody visiting for the first time this morning, I'd like to give you a gift. Anyone that's a first-time guest and you'll accept my gift, I'll give you a copy of the cross. First-time guest. In the back. Come on, bro. And, yeah, come on. <laughs> Bruce, help me. Give this to my brother, please. Welcome to the house, my friend. And Sweet. Hope you enjoy that. When <clears throat> after, after the resurrection, Jesus meets up with the disciples. And he, most of what he says to them is forward looking. He's going to give them a commission. He's going to talk about where it's going. But he has one thing to say in retrospect. He's going to give one word about the cross. He's going to debrief very briefly with them on the cross. And it's our text this morning, Luke 24. Then Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Here's what Jesus has to say about his cross. After the fact, he says to the disciples, It was necessary. Had to happen. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say that was the biggest injustice of human history. Should have never happened. Notice what he didn't say. Pilate is really going to regret this. Notice what he didn't say. All oh, the chief priests, man, they blew it big on that one. Look what he didn't say. He doesn't go, oh, man, the devil came after me, and I was looking for you guys for a little bit of moral support. Where were you when I needed you? He's got one thing to say about the cross. It was necessary. The cross had to happen. He's going, I had to do the cross to fulfill righteousness. I had to do the cross to purchase your salvation. I had to do the cross to take on the devil. I had to do the cross to win a bride for myself. The cross was necessary. Peter, now, now the word that he uses is the Greek word die, D-E-I, not sure I'm pronouncing it right, D-E-I, and it means necessary. Jesus used that word quite a bit in his preaching ministry before the cross. And the most common theme when he was using that word was when he was talking about the cross. And he would say things like, the Son of Man must suffer. He must be betrayed. He must be crucified. He, he, before the cross, he was always using that word. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. After the cross, he uses the same word. It was necessary. It had to happen. Peter is going to pick up on that exact same word and use it in his epistle. Our next scripture is 1 Peter chapter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, but the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes,
perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Come back to the earlier frame, please. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, there it is. Literally, if being necessary. Peter goes, sometimes our fiery trials are necessary. And by using the same word that Jesus used, Peter is, now listen to this, he is drawing a straight line between the cross of Jesus and our fiery trials. And he's saying, just as the cross was necessary for Jesus, fiery trials are also sometimes necessary in our lives. And he goes, because it produces gold, it, it, even more valuable than gold, he goes, your trial is your certification. There's a day coming when you're going to stand before God, and the question is going to be, was this the real thing? And they're going to look and they're going, look what she came through. She came through the valleys. She came through floods. She came through fire. She had finances against her. She had family against her. She had circumstances against her. She had her health against her. And with hell against her, temptation against her, the world against her, and with everything against her, she stood and gave me her love. She endured in the fiery trials of life, and heaven is going to look at your faith on that day, my sister, and they're going to put an official imprimatur on it and stamp your faith a seal of authenticity. This is the real thing. And our trials become our certification that demonstrate the authenticity of our faith. And then, the, and then Peter goes on to say, so, and it's going to be to praise and honor and glory in that day. And I'm just going to tell you, it's not going to be to your praise. They're not going to be going, oh, look what she did. Wasn't she awesome? It's going to be to the praise of the grace of Jesus Christ. They're going to look at you. She was a train wreck, but look what the grace of Jesus accomplished in her life. And we are going to be trophies of the grace of Christ because he's got enough grace to bring you through. This kind of faith is so valuable that Peter says it's more valuable than gold. If you're going to get this kind of faith, sometimes you're going to need trials in life. Sometimes you don't know what you've got until you test a thing. You decide to buy a car, bro. And you go to the dealer, and you're looking at the car, and you're looking at, like, well, I like the color, and I like the model, and I like the specs, and uh, I can even live with the price. But before I buy this car, can I take it for a test drive? Because until you test it, you're not really sure what you're buying. Character is not known until it's proven 
by temptation. That's a whole sermon for you, Chris. Love is not known until it's proven by hatred. Faith is not known until it's proven by trials. And I can imagine somebody, okay, I, let's, let's just imagine that we've got a critic in the house today that's a little bit cynical of what I'm saying, and I can imagine a critic saying back to me something like this. Oh, Bob, if trials are such a blessing for you, may you be baptized in them. Okay, I, I get that objection. It's, that's valid. It's fair. So let me answer it. Trials are not a blessing. When God blesses in your life, when he brings provision, when he brings security, when he brings favor, when God blesses in your life, the scripture says that the blessing of the Lord makes us rich and he adds no sorrow to it. So when he's blessing in your life, there comes no sorrow with it. S trials come with many sorrows. It's not a blessing, it's a trial. But if we will respond properly to the trials of life and buy gold in the fire, the trial actually turns into a portal that opens us to some of the greatest riches in the kingdom of God because you can't really buy gold in the fire until you've got a trial. And now the riches of the kingdom open because we endured in faith through the trial. Trials freshen up our fragrance. I've got a verse for it that's not going to be on your screen. I want you to just uh, find your Bible if you got it right there. It's Jeremiah 48, 11. So if you got a device or if you got a paper Bible, find that real fast because I don't have this one on our screen. It's about the nation of Moab. Jeremiah 48, 11. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his dregs and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him and his scent has not changed. God is talking about the nation of Moab and likening it to a vat of wine. In the winemaking process, wine is taken from one vessel and poured into another vessel to get it off the dregs. Now we can dispense with the dregs and the wine can move forward in the process of fermentation and perfection. You want to get the wine off the dregs so that it's not stale and bitter. But God said to the nation of Moab, you just sat there. It would have been better if you had been taken into captivity or something, but you just sat there on your dregs, and now you'll stink. And 
judgment is coming on the nation of Moab because they were never poured from vessel to vessel. Did you know that nations have a fragrance to God? I wonder what America smells like. I think it's better not to know. <laughs> Churches have a fragrance to God. Households, individuals have, have a fragrance to God. Have you ever asked yourself, what do I smell like? <laughs> And God sometimes looks at our lives and he's going, you've just been sitting there. You've been in the same city, on the same street, living in the same house, working the same job, going to the same school, attending the same church for too long. <laughs> We're going to mix this one up. And he pours us. Hello, Grace. <laughs> he pours us from vessel to vessel. And we're over here going, what is going on here? And he's like, I'm freshening you up. Look at your life now. Look at the flame that's in your eyes. Look at the fire that's freshly in your heart. You're weeping again when you're reading the word. You're in love with evil. You found your first love all over again. There's a fresh faith, a fresh love, a fresh devotion. He has freshened you up. And I'm saying you've needed this year. You need it to be poured from vessel to vessel. It was his kindness. And now the fragrance of your life is refreshed in his presence. There is a scientific experiment in a little town in Arizona, a place called Oracle, Arizona. I've never been there. Uh, so I just Googled this one. Uh, but they've got a, a scientific experiment there called the biosphere. The biosphere, it's these buildings, like these half-domed buildings in the middle of the Arizona desert. I think somebody had too much money. They decided to build these self-contained ecosystems sealed off from the outside environment. And in this self-contained ecosystem, the idea was this, Bruce. They're like, if we can get life to sustain on its own inside this bubble, can we copy-paste it and put it on Mars? It was speculative. They're giving it a shot. It didn't go so well, but they called themselves the world's largest greenhouse. So somebody goes, let's plant some fruit trees in this biosphere. We can control the light. We can control the temperature. We can control the water. We can control the fertilizer. We can control everything and give these plant, these trees, ideal growing conditions. What would happen if you gave a fruit tree perfect growing conditions. They did it. Sure enough, these fruit trees produced an abundant, vibrant harvest with one problem. The branches kept snapping under the weight of the fruit. Because there was 
no wind in this artificial environment. Did you know that trees need wind? Trees need wind to keep their branches flexible so that when the weight of the fruit of a new season comes on the branches, instead of being brittle and snapping, the branches will flex and bend to support or the weight of a new growing season. Sometimes we need wind. Sometimes we need storms. Not a soul in the room that enjoys storms, but sometimes we need them. Keeps us flexible so we can support the next fruit season. I was coming home from, I think from Europe, someplace like that, and I'm on one of those long transatlantic flights. You know what that's about, Grace. And, and, and when you're on one of those long flights across the Atlantic, you look at that screen in front of you and you're like, is there anything on this screen that is worthy of my attention? And the options are pretty dismal. But I found a documentary on winemaking. And I'm like, yeah, let's check this out. In this documentary, they were talking about what produces a vintage wine. My understanding of a vintage wine is a wine from a particular year that because of the growing conditions of that particular year, it produced a wine of an exceptional flavor. And they'll talk about it for years, the wine of 2012. Get yourself a bottle from 2012 you probably won't even be able to find one. But if you do, you probably won't be able to afford it. But if you can, 2012. It was a vintage wine. And in this documentary, they're sharing what produces a vintage wine. And I'm a novice watching the documentary, and I'm going, I know what produces a vintage wine. You just have lots of sun, lots of rain, lots of good warm temperatures, and voila! Vintage wine. And they go, actually, the opposite. To get a vintage wine, you have to have a hard season, an adversarial season. Too much sun, not enough sun. Too much rain, not enough rain. Too cold of temperatures. Adversarial conditions that force the vines to work extra hard. And when the vines are forced to work hard, that's where you get a vintage wine. They said it like this. You will never get a vintage wine from an unstressed vine. And then they go like this. 
they said. A vine dresser will never irrigate a vineyard in a drought. And I'm a novice going, bro, that's exactly the time you need to irrigate your vineyard. Hello, there's no rain. And the farmer goes, no, if I irrigate my vineyard in this drought, the roots of the vines will return to the surface to capture the surface moisture. But if I intentionally stress the vines by intentionally withholding irrigation from them, the roots of those vines have only one direction to go. And now, under the duress of drought, the vines are pushing their roots deeper than they've ever pushed before, desperate to survive. Does anybody understand holy desperation? Does anybody in the room know what it's like to feel like I'm just trying to survive here? And in the fight to survive, the vines are now push, putting all their strength into their roots, pushing those roots to desperately try to find moisture. And in the push to find moisture, they are pushing roots into crevices and crannies and places in the ground that have never been touched by a root before. Did you know that soil gets tired? Anybody do a, a garden in the room? Soil gets depleted. But now the roots are touching soil for the truckies, going where no root has gone before. Touching unreached minerals, untapped nutrients, the roots are now accessing fresh minerals. And they said, that's where you get a vintage wine. You actually need at this drought. You've needed this storm. You've needed to be poured from vessel to vessel. You've needed the last two years. You have needed this fiery trial. This drought in your life has made you so desperate that now you are putting roots into the Holy Spirit and into the Word of God, desperate to survive. You are now pushing the roots of your heart into places in the heart of God, and He is perfecting a vintage wine with your life because Here's a one-liner to write down and retweet. Stressed vines produce vintage wines. The Lord's just interpreted your last year for you. You have needed this year.
Just as the cross was necessary for Jesus Christ, your fiery trial, Peter goes, it's been necessary for you too. Look what he's doing in your life. Look at the faith that's being matured. Goal refined in your life. This is the real thing. A fresh fragrance of love in your heart. Look how flexible you're getting. The fruit is now going to sustain in your life. And a vintage wine that is for none other than the lips of Jesus Christ. And he alone is going Going to enjoy the fragrance of your life because you put down roots in the middle of your drought. I close with one final verse. There's a verse in the Bible that tells us that Jesus worshiped on the cross. And to find this verse, you can't find it in the gospel record. You've got to go back to David. David in Psalm 22 enters into the passion of the cross and he begins to write prophetically as he's actually embodying, even in his own fiery trial, he's embodying the anguish of the cross and it's very personal for him. And he goes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he's sharing in the sufferings of Christ? Christ. And then he goes in verse 3. This is Psalm 22, verse 3. He goes, you are holy. And David reveals to us that on the cross, Jesus worshipped his Father. You are holy. You have forsaken me, and you are holy. You have turned me over to the wolves, and you are holy. You have abandoned me, and you are holy. You have set me up as your target, and I worship you. You have taken everything away from me, and I bless your holy name. And he stood on the nail, spread his arms, and with heaven against him, with hell against him, and with people against him, he lifted his dove's eyes to his father, and he said, you are holy. And he worshiped his father on the cross. When you say you are holy, here's what you're saying. You are perfect. You are brilliant. You are wise. You are generous. You are good. You are true. You are merciful. You are compassionate. You are perfect in all your ways. I worship you because when, when you say you are holy, it's just all of that wrapped up into one sweet word. And he on the cross, Jesus was worshiping his father's fatherhood. You are fathering me, Abba, and you are holy. You have abandoned me, and you are perfect. Your leadership in my life is perfect. Your will in my life, it's brilliant. And I worship you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. It was a struggle for me to get to a place where I could say to the Lord about my vocal situation. I, I, I think I didn't mention it earlier, but I've got a vocal affliction that I endure. Every word is painful for me. They're, they're cranking the house system so that I can be heard. And so fiery trial, I, I, under, I, I really connect with this. It, and, and it's it, for years, I could not say to the Lord, thank you for this trial. I could worship him in spite of the trial. I could worship him in the trial. 
but I couldn't worship him for the trial because I thought in my own understanding that if I say to the Lord, thank you for this trial, I thought that meant that I was then accepting it as my permanent lot in life. But I could not accept it as my permanent lot in life because I've got promises in the Holy Spirit. I've got promises of deliverance. I've got promises of healing. And I will not let go my promise. And I didn't know how to give thanks for the trial while still holding on to my promise until our text this morning. Come back, please, to Luke 24. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and look and to rise from the dead the third day. The cross was necessary and the resurrection was also necessary. It's not just your fiery trial that's necessary. It's your resurrection that's necessary. It's not... It's not, I, I just feel like preaching, Jenna. Uh, it's not just the crushing in your life that's necessary. It's also the release from this prison that's necessary. He never meant for the cross to be Jesus Christ's last chapter. And he never means for the cross to be your last chapter either. He'll take you through the cross, but it's because the resurrection is also necessary. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. We're taking this, Lord Jesus. We're, we're, we're letting this get into our spirits today. Beloved, there are birds that want to steal seed from your heart today. Do not let the birds take this one from you today. Get it in your spirit. Jesus, my trial is necessary, and I'm laying hold of it. My resurrection is necessary. I've been walking through a crushing in my family, but I'm believing you for my family. I've been walking through a physical affliction, but I'm believing you you also for my healing. Lord, I don't understand why I've, I've been, my whole career has been crushed, but I'm holding on to a promise from you. And just as your trial has been necessary, it is equally necessary that you come all the way through to resurrection. And we want to stand with you for your faith to be purified like fire. And we want to stand with you for your faith to come through with resurrection power and a testimony for your children. Your children are watching your life. Your grandchildren are watching your life. A generation is looking at your life. And we need some saints that will come through these trials by gold in the fire and lay hold of resurrection power. And I am asking Lord Jesus for faith to come alive in every heart now. And I'm, I'm laying hold of it for myself. Lord Jesus, I'm asking that you would strengthen our faith today to endure in the trial, to lay hold of your purpose, and to be resurrected in the life of the Holy Spirit. We want to be available to pray for anyone that connects with this message in a personal way. You don't have to come forward to connect with the message, but sometimes you just want to come up here and just say, I I'm coming to worship my God. You are holy. You're, you are brilliant. I want to say thank you for my trial. I want to say thank you for my circumstances. I want to say thank you for the path that you have chosen for me. I'm worshiping you in it, and I'm worshiping you for it because you are holy, and I invite you to 
to join our worship ministry today, to come and stand at this altar. Lift, come on, sis. Lift your lift your hands to the Lord and open your heart to him and love him with all your heart. You are good. You are generous. You are kind. You are gracious. And I give you my love. I give you my heart. We're going to join and sing together. Our, our pastors and our team are going to be available here. I'll pray and bless you in the name of Jesus. Whether you come forward or whether you stay and respond in your seat, may there be grace from above today to strengthen your hands that have been hanging down. Those hands are getting strength today. There's strength coming into weak knees that have collapsed and you're going to be strengthened to stand and to walk forward in the grace of God. I bless your hands. I bless your knees. I bless your feet to walk forward in the grace of God. Let faith be established in every heart today. I pray even through the webcast, faith to those watching this in their living room. Let faith arise in your hearts because God is for you. And I invite you now. Give it. Give him your heart. You are